Welcome everyone. Welcome to day 43 of the 75 days of Partition Live podcast series that the 1947 Partition Archive has been doing to, to mark this landmark year. I'm Sonam Kalra, a singer with my own body of work in music delving into the partition. And I'm here on behalf of the 1947 Partition Archive to welcome today a very, very special guest on this series. Someone I have great admiration for as a woman and an artist. And I have had the pleasure of meeting Salima Ji in person in Lahore when I was blessed to be able to go perform there at the Fairs Peace Festival. Salima Ji is an incredible woman, a Pakistani painter, artist, former college professor, anti-nuclear weapons activist, and former caretaker minister in the Najam Sethi caretaker ministry in Pakistan. She has served for four years as a professor and the Dean of National College of Arts, and she's guided some of the most prominent contemporary artists. She's the eldest daughter of the renowned poet Fez Ahmed Fez and his British-born wife, writer and peace activist, Alice Fez. She represents the first generation of modern artists in Pakistan who carry an artistic identity which is different from indigenous artists. She's known for condemning the Pakistani and Indian nuclear programs. She's one of the few Pakistani intellectuals who condemned the nuclear tests by India and Pakistan in 1998. She received the Pride of Performance Award in 1999 for her services to the nation. One of Pakistan's most well-known artists, she's known not only for her prowess with the brush, but also as her role as an educator, writer, curator, and human rights activist. She grew up in a politically conscious environment, but she used her art to communicate her views on politics. She's written books on artistic practices in the subcontinent, including the I Still Speaks, Pakistani contemporary art, and of course, she brought an absolutely a fantastic exhibition called The Night Bitten Dawn on the aftermath, aftermath of Partition, which was curated by her, but it featured Indian and Pakistani artists and was presented in Delhi by the Devi Art Foundation and the Gujral Foundation. Selimanji, so, honestly, it's so, so exciting and wonderful to have you here, to know that I can have this conversation with you and to know that technology allows us to talk across borders. Thank you so much for being here, Salima Ji. Thank you. Thank you. It's a rare privilege, Sonam. Firstly, to be talking like this, as you say, technology allows it when others would not. And secondly, because it's you. And we're Thank waiting you. for to sing, sing your heart out in front of our audiences who are very discerning and they loved you. No, and thank you. One of my most special. You could feel the passion that you brought of peace and friendship from across those lines that divide us. So thank you. Delight to be here. Thank you so much, Salima Ji. And we have another thing in common. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But you were born in Delhi. Is that correct? I was born in Delhi. Absolutely. And how how old were you when partition happened? Had you already moved at that time? And what are your memories of partition? Well, I was four years old. As I had my fourth birthday in Delhi. So, you know, and it was post that I bought uh, three months after that, that we moved in the beginning of uh, 47 um, from Delhi to Lahore because my father had been offered the editorship of uh, the newly set up Pakistan Times. They knew by that time that Pakistan was coming and right. um, felt that it needed um, strong editorship, strong journalism. So he came and he, there was two papers, one in Urdu called him Rose and one in English called the Pakistan Times, which later became a much quoted newspaper known for its uh, independent views um, and which were very often critical of mm -hmm. both Indian and Pakistani um, nations' narratives. They believed in the people's narratives. Um, so I was four, about four and a, a bit when we came. and in, But in fact, on the 14th of August, which is what we celebrate as Independence Day, we were in Sirinagar because my English grandparents had come from England. And so the whole family, my father was still in the war, but the whole family moved to have a summer um, up there. And that is where we celebrated. It was uh, two days before Eid. Um, there was no thought that there would be violence, though there were rumblings. And my father was worried and he was he asked my mother to return, and myself and my little sister, who you've already met. 
Um, and that when we moved down to Murray was when we became aware of what else came with independence, the great carnage that followed it, which as a little child, you can't forget. Um, you may see things immediately in front of you, but you sense the pain. And that is what I remember most vividly, arriving in Murray and um, my mother teaming up with other, other women to stop the killing and deciding to bring out a peace procession. I've often mentioned this. And there yes. I was, you know, with other children put on these little donkeys, you know, um, those that usually took children out for little uh, joy rides. But there we were leading the, the procession with white flags in our hands. And as I've often said, I've still got that white flag. I'm you too. It in good times and bad. Absolutely. So that, yes. that is a very strong memory. And many others, not so happy, but also a sense many times that, OK, these were newly independent countries and we had a lot to do. That was a kind of general feeling that mm -hmm. there was so much to be done. Um, so even as a small child, you absorb these things and you know that there is um, it's born. Hope is born out of great pain and great right. suffering, right. But, um, but there is hope. So you, I mean, you. when did you get into art? Was it very soon when you were very young? Were you interested in art? Or, because I know you were interested in a lot of theater as well. You know, you said riding on that donkey, I think somewhere you said was my first. I love the performance aspect of it. Yes, yes, I think I did. I was, yes, I was, uh, I was, a, now it seems strange after so many years of teaching and communicating, but I was a terribly shy, withdrawn child, terribly shy and very reclusive. And um, so therefore I was with, you know, drawing, always drawing in the corners of my notebooks at school, did not much, paid not much attention to things like mathematics and drew instead in the columns. Um, I also was terribly shy and therefore made up these fantasies and stories in which only I wrote the script and only I acted and there was no one else in the audience. So, and this happened, you know, on my balcony or you know, in my bedroom or wherever. So um, I was that kind of a child, but I drew from, you know, well, since I remember. And um, as I've said sometimes to my father's friends, when they wanted to know if I had poetic inclinations, that there was no possibility of that. I mean, when you have this person, right. who, you know, so you choose another path. Yeah. And mine had to do with sometimes with the performing arts, but very often to do with the visual arts. Well, you had inspiration all around you. So I think it would be hard not to be in front of yeah. <laughs> But you've worked on the development massively of the development of art and cultural institutions. And it is this is, I'm assuming, because you were inspired by all that was around you. But, you know, one of the things I've always felt and I is that we have a role as artists, not just as artists, I think, as as responsible citizens of humanity, but especially as artists we have a role to use our voices for change. So do you think that all art is political or should be political or, or, or is it humanitarian? What is your view on the role of art in our everyday life? I don't see a difference. I don't see a difference. There is only one basic value and that is humanism. And good politics should right. come out of a feeling of humanism. Uh, otherwise to me, it's, um, it's self-interest. And therefore, um, it was always, you know, because of the comings and goings in the house, because of the fact that there were always artists or writers and musicians or politicians or journalists or intellectuals, it was about making things move. And they can only move if there is the creative impetus. It can be in journalism. It can be in politics. I mean, the, the great politicians are the ones who we remember for the fact that they could be creative in moments of great tension and have great vision and make people better than they could ever think they could be. You know, those right. are the ones that really uh, leave a mark um, right. in hearts and across nations. And therefore, of course, for me then, um, life is politics. 
you know, it's so deeply affected. Uh, therefore, you cannot say, I don't have anything to do with politics. By making that statement, you are in fact taking a position on politics. Um, and to be a humanist uh, means that you do take up a position um, which has a role in public life and in your private life. So then your reason to create these art and cultural institutions would be what specifically? What did you hope to achieve by doing this? Because it sounds like, as you said, it was more about more than just art as people see it. You know, my father once wrote about, wrote about the role of an artist and he said, you know, we are the descendants of the magicians of days gone by. And it was the magicians who held the confidence of their people and the people believed in the magicians. They felt that with their incantations, they could make the clouds come. They could make the crops grow. And uh, because of that, they were able to bend the collective will towards mm. actually great achievement. And he said that, you know, the, in modern times, it is actually the artists who have taken over this role. And they become the voice of the voiceless. And just yesterday, I was on a panel discussion with some young artists, um, not just from Pakistan, but other places, including Sri Lanka. And this young artist who studied with me in Lahore, we, everyone was showing their work. And he said, I don't think I should show my work at this time. I want to show what's happening in Sri Lanka. And he had actually gone out, he was living in Colombo, and taken photographs of the art that people were making in the streets. They had set up a tear gas <laughs> cinema. They had made a coffee stall, which you know was for people who were demonstrating. They had made caricatures of leaders. And this is not necessarily trained artists, so some of them were. But this was the role that this young artist, instead of showing his work, he was showing what was going on around him. And then that is, of course, the role of the artist in such times. You cannot stand apart and think about your work and what you're doing in a studio. You're out there with the people and becoming their voice and putting things out there through images, through talks, through your music. And there were the artists who were singing, there were performers. There was this wonderful performer who was carrying a cross and he walked 60 kilometers. Gosh. So therefore, to me, the role of the artist is the person who is the instigator in the community, who is the healer in the community. He is the person who makes life hopeful and tells people, ensures them that they have the strength to carry on and to be what they hope to be, what they dream of being. So artists often are, they are the, the, have the repository of all our dreams, whether it's in a poem, whether it's a song that you sing, whether it's a painting that I may make, whether it's a play or it's a film, um, that's what they do. That's what they do if they are true to their calling. That's so beautifully said. I had goosebumps when you were saying this, but it's so true. They are also in some ways the oral historians of the time. I mean, peace activists, and you have had all these different roles as well, of being an artist, of being an educator, of being a curator, a writer. You've spoken out when others weren't. You're a peace activist. And how have you sort of balanced all of these roles? I know you'll say, Sona, perhaps I'm imagining you're going to say, Sona, for me, they're no different. And as I frame this question, I realize you're someone who doesn't believe in labels at all. So I can understand the seamlessness. But I think it's it's been really um it's quite incredible for you to be able to do this and i just want to understand from more of a person how have you done this what is your belief deep-rooted belief been that has it's that sort of fires you to do this i don't know i think it's just osmosis you know if you're a sponge as a small child you continue yeah. being a sponge and you especially if you're not tremendously outgoing which i wasn't um, all of that permeates your being and you also listen. You listen to what people are saying, what their stories are. You are one with them, whether it's their pain or whether it's the moment of joy. You know, when my father wrote at partition, ye daag daag ujala, ye shab 
ये वो शहर तो नहीं जिसकी आरज़ू लेकर चले थे यार के यू नो एंड सो ऑन एंड सो फोर्थ यू नो दैट देर वॉज डीप डिसअपॉइंटमेंट एट द पेन दैट अकम्पनीड वट वुड शुड हैव बीन अ मोमेंट ऑफ ग्रेट ट्राइम्फ and he was reviled both by the right who said you know doesn't he know that we are getting a new nation which is going to be called pakistan and by the left who said you know there's a feeling of hopelessness here um, but it was not he was being a witness to his time and that i think is terribly important if you think back and of all the great moments in history what remains of that i don't think really the names of the kings and the queens but what does remain is a wonderful building built by a visionary architect or a great poem or a great book or a great rag something that speaks of the trials and tribulations of those days and long after those days are over people remember and they use all of that to pull them through a new time um if you think of how certain poems um that are very close to me uh, like wa yabka wa jabka which is known as hum dekhenge it was written about something quite different yes and it was recited you know at a moment which was quite different and it continues to be recited even as the context changes from Let's place to the world in so many ways it's from time to time it changes um because people recognize truth you know people recognize truth and they also pick up on anything that embodies what they cannot say um to answer your question it was never an effort on my part at all it was simply what had to be done at that time whether it was taking out a women's demons women's demonstration being part of that during ziaul haq's time Right. whether it was you know speaking up when others would speak up um you know in a, yeah. in a denial of human rights when an a journalist is being vilified you have to write a letter uh, to the highest office in your country to say that we are watching you if you think that we cannot comment so i think and this and it ha- can happen in the smallest of ways if students are being uh, wrongly treated you can be their champion and walk into the vice chancellor's office and say sorry this is this is not acceptable so it doesn't matter how small how large um what it is and you can also make fun of those in power to me humor yeah. has Absolutely. been a great ally you know you yeah. can all say the emperor has no clothes yeah exactly and as it should be i think that's the voice of the people i mean you just said bol ke lab azad hain tere but even just hearing you say two very very important things i think that we forget to be witness to bear witness and to listen that is something i think we've all stopped doing you know we're not ready to listen to each other's perspectives and we don't listen enough to be able to then respond with empathy but speaking coming back to the partition you know you curated an incredible exhibition on partition and i know that you you just recited the poem by fair sahab and he said i think that was the only poem he wrote on partition but you yeah. carried you carried that poem forward into a beautiful translation of it where you created this exhibition with uh, artists from both sides and what was that like talk to us a little bit about that and you know what you wanted to achieve through that as well it just came upon you know by chance when lekha poda rings me up and says you know the devi foundation is teaming up with the, the gujral foundation and the feroz gujral came on the phone and she said you have to do this and i said it's 3 months away you know people take it's, years to set up and curate an exhibition and exhibition on 1947 was said that's why. but they said no we decided you are the person who has to do it and nobody gosh. else and you are going to do it and i was just i was wanting desperate to do it but i was also terribly afraid because you know like my father when i asked him and i i chided him and i said you just wrote one poem on this event you know how could it be yeah and, Yeah, and he just went very quiet, and he said, "We couldn't go." You know, and it just spoke of the helplessness of a man 
who felt so deeply, so deeply that he could not write again about what happened and what was happening. And for me, that was that was something that I could feel, but I also sensed that it was not to be about sadness, grief, mm -hmm. but it was about the strength that allowed us to move forward. And therefore, it had to be a joint project. It had to be Pakistani artists. It had to be Indian artists. It had to be enough women and enough a few token men. So um, it, it was like this. And things naturally fell into place because we chose work, by and large, which apart from one wonderful work by my friend Amar Kamar, which was mm -hmm. a commissioned work, the rest of it was work which was already there in different places. I knew many of the artists. Some uh, had passed away, like Somnath Hore, but I was familiar with his work. And I felt, OK, this epitomizes this poem. And I called it this Night Bitten Dawn, which is yes. a translation of Yadav Dahu Jala. And um, that is how it came about. Many of the works came from the collection of the Devi Foundation. Some came from the artists themselves who I approached. No one said no to me. Amar Kamar felt that it was too big a project for him to take on at such short notice. But I have a, had a way of seducing him. And that, <laughs> <laughs> I sent him the poem recited by my father. Recited oh, my God. How could he so, say no? Absolutely couldn't say then no. He just, you know, then he succumbed and he said, I can't say no. And he did a very, very moving work, which I think, you know, it, it really, I, I sat through it many, many times with tears coming down. And, and I think it had the same effect on so many people who were told me. So that was for me a very important moment because in Delhi, where I was born, I was able to kind of shed a burden Mm -hmm. and also hopefully to build a bridge and to make the artists and the audiences realize um, that that moment which we hoped and wished for had not yet come the culmination is not yet there we have to yeah. carry you know ye ke, we you know ke manzil abhi nahi hai. Aur guftugu banna ho ek tarike se, no? you yeah. kept the conversation going, which is so beautiful that I yes. think that, you know, there's so much both sides want to convey to each other on a person to person level and are we are silenced from doing so. And you yes. opened the chance for these voices to be shared. And I think it must have been absolutely incredible, not just to see the interpretations of artists work, but for artists to know that they were part of this larger collective which was of both people, of both nations together. But do you really believe, do you believe, I mean, I know that be, being, you know, such a great champion of the arts as well, is art the way forward for us to improve, you know, cross-border relations? Is collaboration the way forward for peace? I think it's the only thing at the moment. And when I say the art, I don't restrict it to the visual arts. I believe that creative expression of all kinds is the most important thing, not just for India and Pakistan, not just for South Asia, but for the world today. Because it's not just us you know, who've lost our heads, I would say, and our reason. It is, it is a lot of places in the world in which sometimes conflict seems to be the shortcut to everything. And I think that it is the arts which grow out and blossom in times like these, because it's only the creative spirit which is resilient and which makes artists defiant. Yeah. And out of that, you know, feeling of defiance, of the, out of the feeling that I'm alive, I'm here, and I'm not going to keep quiet, out of that comes the most amazing work. And I think that that is what one hopes for today. I do believe in it because every week I see some work in Pakistan of young artists. And I think, you know, in such dark times, where does this come from? But I know that it comes from within, from, the, from within yeah. our people, from the new generation. I put my hope in them. I don't believe they can be as stupid as our generation. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what is happening is, I can see the humor again, but you know, what's really is so worrying, I think more and more is the kind of censorship that art is facing, that the censorship just 
the just voices are facing from our so-called custodians of culture and that's there's the government censorship there's a sense of board censorships there's the self-proclaimed custodians of culture and there seems to be a self-censorship also in some ways i mean you know when uh, nandita das's movie manto it was banned in pakistan it was edited in india mohammad hanif his book a case of exploding mangoes on uh, a comic it was based on zia ul was confiscated so what are we to do in these sort of situations i mean how do we allow artists the space to to continue to express and as you said to see the light despite the darkness or let the light emerge from the darkness but if there's going to be this constant fear how do we get past that do we just have to I be brave and go on <laughs> having you know i'm a very old lady um i can tell you that there is a streak of stubbornness which is there in people who create because they want they want to be remembered you know there is this feeling of okay, i have to say something plenty of us have been silent many a time in our lives you know it's, we haven't been shouting from the rooftops all the time you choose your moments right. and uh, like like a famous leader said once you outlive your enemies you outlive them through devious ways you choose to navigate your paths you choose to evolve symbols i won't even talk about those countries in which people who worked in cinema or who worked in dance or theater or art have managed to challenge the powers that be but done it in such a way that you just cannot nab them because they seem to they seem to just slide past mm -hmm. um the tough ways of actually um figuring out what they're saying um people speak in ciphers in bad times um i know that um, you know women artists concocted all kinds of symbols during zia's period um which became a symbol of what was happening to them so i think uh, don't give up on the inventiveness of the artists they invent ways of which to be understood keep working have long periods of seeming to be silent mm -hmm. but as you know one of my ustads said soch raha hu soch raha hu so uh, <laughs> the thing is he it it so nahi raha soch raha hu so nahi raha soch raha hu mera soch raha hu but i think that what you've just said is so if 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 there are any artists or writers or activists watching this i think it's really important for them to hear this because you know there is a general fear across the world and to know and to be told or guided so beautifully by you i think it's important for them to hear this and as you and i were talking about i think you had spoken about this in one of your interviews where you were talking of how technology is going to be in some ways a sneaky savior mm -hmm. um you know and the youth yes it is can be the protagonist it can be the savior it can give us a space that we are demanding as long as we learn to use it to our benefit um there are ways in which you know uh in which people learn to outwit the opposition but also how to make friends i think that the important thing is always always to make friends where least expected and to to put your hand forward and to say i'm there um i'm always there and i'll continue to be here um i think that that faith in finding common ground is something that is there all the time and you just have to find that little inch in which you can find the common ground and it it appears in very unexpected ways extremely unexpected ways it's happened to be many a time so um one doesn't want to work talk in clichés and say you know there's always hope etc and people will say stop it you know where's the hope is but something will happen something small and insignificant which then suddenly makes you laugh um you know i remember when i went to see my father after two and a half years of being in zia's pakistan he was in exile in lebanon and i arrived in beirut and almost the first thing he said to me is tell me all the ziaul haq jokes <laughs> he had great faith in the humor of the ordinary pakistani and of course i told him all the jokes in his laugh he said sab zinda hai 
सब ठीक है वो जिंदा है सब ठीक है सो आई एम होपिंग दैट ऑल द जोकर्स दिस साइड एंड दैट साइड आर डूइंग देयर जॉब सब ठीक करें नो but i know you have said this i know you have said this in the past as well that we must make friends because our friends keep our thoughts alive or our our beliefs alive in so many ways so i think that what you're saying is of great value and significance um creative ways to keep these conversations going for these thoughts to continue to to happen i yes. want to ask you one more thing which i'm sure you, you've been asked only a billion and one times but i am going to ask it of you i think you already know the question but what was it like to grow up as fair sahab's daughter and as a child as you said you were a sponge but were you even remotely really aware at that very young age of the influence he had on you or and what was he like as a father you know i you know the times when people usually say okay you know my father was like this or like that must forget that you know at 8 years old i was when he went to jail and i was 12 when he came out almost and that's a that's a very impressionable age for a young girl um and you know that your father has to be away um and my mother took great pains to to let myself and my little sister know that he was not a bad man because all around us i mean the the general feeling was that you know he was a traitor and yes responsible for all kinds of ills um but he you know she would sit us down and say you know he's not a thief he's not a smuggler he's not a killer he tells the truth so pretty soon you realize that there's a price to be paid um for being who you want to be and that's something that stays with you um i didn't think he was a great man when i was a kid i just thought he was a special man it was only i, th- I think when his first book came out from but while he was still in prison and um, it was being launched in a hotel and my mother i was handing out the copies uh, to the people there in my best clothes and people were opening the book and reading and i noticed that the words had an effect and there were some grown men who had tears in their eyes and i suddenly realized that what my father had had an effect on other people and that they he was far away behind high walls but somehow the words had traversed those walls and were there and they were creating an effect that has a great impression on a child you know an 11 year old child um and then you thought okay he's a kind of a magician really that he can do this um but otherwise he was a very um and prepossessing dad he was nobody special there was very democratic household you know what everybody said went and um we would make fun of him and we used to tease him and uh, he there was never this sort of patriarchal setup in the house at all it was very you know free and easy and um, uh, i think only once did uh, i was reading uh, i think i was reading ml zola and uh, he came in he asked my mother is she old enough to read this and my mother said of course it's in your library so he he never asked again what i could read and what that the only thing we were never told what we were going to be when we grew up we were never told who we should marry it was that you know we there was a confidence that if my parents had done their job well we would know what to do with our lives and that confidence served us well because eventually yeah. we did know what to do with our lives sort of um i mean the plenty of people who try to sort of yeah, like it rather <laughs> not to make it the way that you would have liked to have been i mean my husband was arrested during the yaz regime exactly 30 years to the date that my father had you know been oh arrested oh my god i don't know so you know it was like oh so things are going wrong so, yes um, but you know uh, i know that with hindsight it was perhaps the best experience of my life because it teaches you the basics it teaches you what is loyalty what is friendship what is truth what is betrayal all all the things that i think make um, make life uh, easy to understand 
I don't make life easy, but yes. you can understand better. No, but I think to have lived your life with truth, um, with equality, with these very, very important values, I don't think that there's much else one really needs from life. No, if you that you can live like this, but yeah. I just. We've run it out a little over time, but it's it's hard to stop speaking to you when it's such an interesting conversation. But these are micro podcasts, uh, micro podcasts that the 1947 Partition Archive is doing. So I'm going to have to say that we're going to I'm going to request them to do another conversation, a to be continued, like a Netflix series or something. Um, but Salimaji, thank you for everything that you do. All that you try and say, and you do manage to say through art, and as you said through through the human voices through humanity but i do want you to end with something that words that i read today by fez sahab which i think really allow a lot of us to stop and think and should make us think of the way forward so please if you would end with those with those words and we hope we'll see you again very very soon yes lovely well this is a poem that he wrote uh, called tum hi kaho kya karna hai and um, I often think that he's talking to both the peoples on both sides of uh, the border. And you know, because when he said, Jab dukhi nadia mein humne jeevan ki nao dali thi, itna gaspal paadru mein thi, badlahu mein kitni lali thi, yun lagta tha do haath lage, aur nao puram paar lage, aur aisa na hua, ye dhare thi, which ande ki patwaare thi. कुछ मांझी थे अनजान बहुत कुछ बेपरखी पतवारे थे अब जो भी कहो छान करो अब जितने चाहो दोष था नदिया तो वही है नाव वही अब तुम ही कहो क्या करना है ये खाओ कैसे भरना है वी हैव टू डू इट आर सेल्फ देर इज नो थर्ड पावर दैट इज गोइंग टू कम अलॉन्ग इन टेल अस हाउ टू सॉल्व आर वी हैव टू गो आउट so beautiful thank you so much salima ji and thank you for leaving us with these very important words and this thought for a way forward a better way forward and for all of you who have i'm sure been glued to your screens for this incredible conversation that i have had the privilege of having with salima hashmi ji professor salima hashmi please join us tomorrow for day 44 of 75 days of partition which just so you know is a daily micro podcast series which is being aired for 75 days between the 3rd of june and the 17th of august 22 uh, 2022 except for sundays and we're doing this to mark the 75th anniversary of partition the series entails live conversation bursts with historians filmmakers authors artists and other practitioners who are working on uncovering and understanding the history of partition our goal is to introduce new findings to you to spark your curiosity explore new fresh perspectives and perhaps change your mind gently through short daily micro discussions i'll see you all tomorrow thank you so much bye bye <laughs>